In another world, a short-haired guy was falling down at a very high speed like a meteor falling from the sky, and he never would have thought that he, a small-time editor for literary and historical magazines, would become a transmigrator. He fell from the sky towards an inhabited area that seemed like an ancient residence. As he transmigrated, his hair grew long, and he was now wearing traditional clothes. Not only did he become a transmigrator, but he even received an opus cheat to boot. He gained the skill Invincible After Death, which meant that if he were killed, he would inherit all the powers stored within the system and instantly become an emperor of the upper realm. But self-harm or suicide doesn't count. He started to imagine himself sitting on the emperor's throne, where many people bow in front of him, and he drooled as he said that as long as he got himself killed, he would become a heavenly emperor. Suddenly, someone poked him on the shoulder to get his attention, which startled him. The person asked him why he was standing around because they had to get going. The person bowed to him and called him Lord Yi, reminding him about the extremely important imperial meeting. As the official seal bearer, he must not be late. He nonchalantly gave the person an affirmative response, but in his mind, he just remembered that in the world he transmigrated to, he was the official in charge of safekeeping the emperor's jade seal. He learned this after inheriting the memories of the body's original owner. The two of them arrived at the Great Zhu Imperial Palace, describing the image of what seemed to be high-ranking officials. He explained that the world he was currently in was similar to the Warring States era of the spring and autumn periods of his previous world where the land was divided into nine provinces ruled over by the emperor. To appease the dukes, six provinces were granted to them. It happened because several generations of incompetent emperors allowed the power to shift out of the royal family's hands. While portraying the image of a very young emperor, he said that at the present, the empire's destiny has already dissipated with no way of reclaiming it. While depicting the six dukes and the immortal sect in an evil manner, he said that while the imperial palace was declining, all the six dukes took the opportunity to increase their influence, and they were each backed by an immortal sect, further allowing them to disregard the emperor's power. As the emperor sat in front of his audience for the imperial meeting, he stated that according to the memories of the original owner of the body he inhabited, the Ascension sect planned to team up with the six dukes to force the emperor to abdicate another province. The representative of the Ascension sect, perfected he Yuani, bowed down before the emperor and introduced himself as a representative of the Ascension sect. He nominated the Lai family for dukedom and, in exchange, the Ascension sect would protect the great Zhu dynasty for 10,000 years. In response, the Zhu emperor, Jai Minju, asked him what would happen if the court didn't agree. He and he glared at Jai Minju and asked if he was unwilling. Although sweat was running down Jai Minju's face, he toughened up and told He Yuani that while the Lai family had some achievements, they were not enough to warrant dukedom. If titles of duke were randomly conferred, the ministers and the people wouldn't agree. Still staring daggers at Jai Minju, He Yuani questioned him about the ministers and the people. Then he gestured with his hands and said that they, the immortal sects, represented the people and the ministers. The ministers bowed down in unison and told Jai Minju that the Lai family had achieved remarkable merit so they had no objection and requested him to confer the title of duke upon them. Meanwhile, behind the ministers, Lord Yi observed from the sidelines. He internally sighed and thought that being the emperor was not an easy job. Then he wondered if there really was no one on the emperor's side in the court. His companion replied and informed him that the emperor had just one trusted aide, Liu Shen, but he called in sick when the emperor needed him the most. His companion even added a remark that he was a waste of the emperor's trust. Then his companion added more, saying that if it weren't for Liu Shen's bewitchment, the emperor wouldn't have spent most of his time playing around. Lordy agreed and in his thoughts, he clicked his tongue and thought that if it were him, he wouldn't dare to be too good at his job because he would be the first to be eliminated by those rebels. Returning to the meeting, Jai Minju opened a scroll as he stated that since he Yuani claimed to represent the people, he confronted him about the reports from the civilians. Jai Minju was enraged and he slammed his hands on the table, along with the open scroll, and said that they were all records of the abuse and exploitation that the Lai family had committed. He questioned how such people could deserve to be conferred a dukedom. Lordy's companion commended Jai Minju's move, and he was immersed in the meeting, trying to see what the opposition had to say. But Lordy shook his head as he knew that reasoning with those in power was useless. Then, as he put his hands under his chin, Lordy had the realization that it was the perfect opportunity to die. And since he was dying anyway, he might as well play the role of a loyal minister and die with honor. The Duke of Wai, Cao Meng, stepped forward and drew his sword with an ominous aura. Fire emerged in the court as Cao Meng slashed the table with his fire-imbued sword in front of Jai Minju, which frightened him. With an evil grin, Cao Meng said that it was a shame, but it seemed like the reports were lost in an accident. Sweat
sweat ran down Jai Minju's face as he could not believe Cao Meng's audacity to destroy the reports. Cao Meng then put on a show and bowed at Jai Minju, politely requesting him to confer the title, to which the entire court followed. Jai Minju was extremely horrified when Cao Meng lowered his head and handed him a scroll, saying that they had already prepared the imperial decree. With a sinister smirk, he looked sideways and asked where the seal bearer was, questioning why he was not giving the seal to Jai Minju quickly so he could stamp the decree. Behind the ministers, Lord Yi called them rebels at the top of his lungs and declared that he would never hand the jade seal over to them. He was enraged and called them out for daring to rebel against Jai Minju. The ministers made way for him as he pointed at them and reprimanded them for daring to actually defy Jai Minju and force him to confer a title. He also questioned them about how they could dare to call themselves ministers of the Zhu dynasty. Jai Minju looked surprised as Lord Yi continued to point at the ministers and scold them to their faces, while his companion looked horrified and commented that Lord Yi was so fierce. Jai Minju looked at the scene with awe, and as he realized that it turned out his seat still had someone on its side, tears filled his eyes. Suddenly, an old man yelled and called him impudent, and he walked over to Lord Yi. It was the Minister of Finance, Zheng Heorin, and he called out Lord Yi for daring to spout nonsense in the Imperial Court when he was just a low-ranking official. Lord Yi asked him who he was, and he introduced himself as the Minister of Finance, Zheng Heorin. Lord Yi looked displeased as he pointed at Zheng Heorin, questioning what kind of finance minister he was. He said that he must be a well-raised scholar, but it was a shame that all those books he had read had gone to waste in his rotten dog brain. Zheng Heorin was so shocked by Lord Yi's direct insults that he could not say anything back immediately. And when he was about to retort, Lord Yi cut him off and became more aggressive, appearing like a raging giant shrouded with an ominous aura. He continued to point at him as he questioned what he was doing joining hands with those traitorous scums to pressure Jai Minju when he was a minister of Great Chu. Lord Yi said that he was just a parasitic dog, a brainless animal, and a piece of human trash. However, he took back his words and said that calling him trash was an insult to all garbage. He then continued to scold him and said that people like him weren't worth talking to, telling him to stay in a corner where he won't infect others with his idiocy. This made Zheng Heorin feel small and rendered him speechless. Zheng Heorin was hit so hard by Lord Yi's insults that he started to cough up blood, which surprised another member of the court. As two members of the court caught Zhang Heorin, who had lost consciousness while continuing to spurt out blood, Lord Yi let out a deep breath and bowed, declaring that he was done and calling for his next challenger. Suddenly, someone drew a sword beside him and called his attention. It was Cao Meng, and as he unsheathed his sword, with an evil grin and an ominous aura shrouding him, he asked Lord Yi if he really thought that he wouldn't dare to kill him in the imperial court. Unfazed and looking more ecstatic, Lord Yi clicked his tongue and questioned Cao Meng for actually bringing a sword into the imperial court, accusing him of wanting to kill Jai Minju and steal the throne. Lord Yi then stood in front of Jai Minju and challenged Cao Meng to come forward, which startled Jai Minju. Jai Minju looked up to Lord Yi with awe as he stood there, confidently pointing at himself with his thumb and declaring that if Cao Meng wanted to kill Jai Minju, he would have to step over his cold, dead body. Lord Yi stood near Jai Minju's throne and declared that if they wanted to harm him, then they must walk over his dead body first. Some members of the court were surprised as they didn't think there was such a virtuous person in their generation of scholars. They saw him as a role model of the scholars, which they couldn't compare with at all, and it made them ashamed of themselves. Jai Minju sat there, surprise written all over his face, as he could not believe that in the thousand years of history, his great Zhu finally had a loyal subject who was not afraid of dying. Jai Minju then looked dejected as he looked down and thought that although he had tried his best to keep a low profile since he took the throne, he must not let a loyal subject die because of him. He felt conflicted as he knew that he must protect Lord Yi, but he didn't know how he would do it without revealing all his cards. Cao Meng shrouded himself in an aura along with his sword, which he pointed at Lord Yi while asking him if he really thought that he wouldn't dare. With a confident smile on his face, Lord Yi stared directly at the blade that was right before his eyes and told Cao Meng to get on with it. Seeing Lord Yi's reaction, Cao Meng was now second-guessing. As he stood there, pointing his sword, engulfed in his aura, at Lord Yi, he wondered where he came from because there was no fear in his eyes at all. Cao Meng lowered his sword and came face to face with Lord Yi, asking him if he really was not afraid and telling him that if he was doing it for honor, he would guarantee that no one would remember his name after he died. But Lord Yi remained unfazed, staring eye to eye with Cao Meng. Lord Yi took a step forward, and Cao Meng stepped to the side as he extended his arms and said that he may be nameless, but with the mountains and rivers as his witnesses, he would leave a mark in history. In front of the court, his words echoed. It even reached the Imperial Court and the Great Zhu Palace, making its way to an old man's monument that shone the moment his words reached it. The people from the streets also heard his words and wondered what that voice was that they were hearing. 
Even a teacher who was teaching his class heard it and caught his attention. The students in the class started to glow like the monument did, and they looked at their arms, surprised that the voice was actually able to resonate with the sages of yore. Back at the imperial court, one of the ministers was talking about how the school of Confucianism had been suppressed by the immortal sex for so long that it had been ages since he last heard such virtuous words. Another minister exclaimed that it was a once in a thousand year occurrence, and another official added that back in the days of his ancestors, there were many great Confucian scholars, and they were all mighty figures who were able to dictate the the life and death of others using pen and paper alone. As Lord Yi stood proudly in front of them, they said that although he was just a low-ranking official, he had the courage and great value, and he would definitely accomplish great things in the future. This was rare for the school of Confucianism to produce such a talent. Meanwhile, sweat ran down Yi Yuanyi's face as he anxiously looked back at the officials, and he cursed Lord Yi in his head, knowing that opening his mouth would reignite the scholarly key in the group of deadbeat officials. Meanwhile, Lord Yi stood in front of Cao Meng and looked at him in anticipation, while in his thoughts he told Cao Meng to not just stand there but to go ahead and kill him. But he got extremely confused and surprised when Cao Meng burst into laughter, praising him for his well-said words. He was even more surprised when Cao Meng put his sword back in its sheath and said that his sword did not kill heroes. But the surprise did not end there, as Lord Yi was yet again startled when Cao Meng cupped his fist and told him that the Great Jew's decline was irreversible, so Lord Yi shouldn't go down with it. Cao Meng then proceeded to offer that if he came with him to the Kingdom of Wai, he would grant him a position as one of his highest officials. Seeing what Cao Meng did, Jai Minju gritted his teeth and sweat ran down his face as he anxiously stared at them, cursing in his head. He thought that Cao Meng was really not regarding him highly at all, as he dared to poach his people right in front of him. However, he admitted that it was also true that with the current situation of Great Ju, he couldn't give Lord Yi anything at all. While Jai Minju looked at Lord Yi longingly, pleading for him not to delve into his thoughts, Lord Yi looked at Cao Meng repulsively. He spurted out blood and cursed, wondering if Cao Meng was sick in the head because he expected that it was the part where he would get angrier and kill him, but he stopped. Continuing his act, Lord Yi pointed at Cao Meng, who was surprised, and said that he would rather die than betray the Great Zhu Dynasty. With a confident grin on his face, Cao Meng gestured with his hand towards Jai Minju, who was surprised and asked Lord Yi why he would do such a thing and wondered if an emperor's cowardly and incompetent puppet would be better than him. In response, Lord Yi bowed down to Jai Minju and said that he was born poor and could only enter the court because of the emperor's grace. He closed his eyes and solemnly said that it was a debt of gratitude that he would repay, even at the cost of his life. Jai Minju couldn't contain his delight as he stood up from his throne and praised Lord Yi for his well-spoken words. While thinking that Yi King, Lord Yi's full name, was willing to die for him, even though he had never even heard of his name before that day. But as he looked at Yi King, who was surrounded by the opposition, Jai Minju's expression quickly turned to worry, and he thought that since Yi King was ready to die for him, he wouldn't let him get hurt even if he had to reveal his trump cards that day. However, Yi King was surprised when Cao Meng turned his back on him with his arms crossed, and while praising his well-said words, announced that he was a little tired at the moment and would no longer participate in the day's affairs. As Cao Meng walked away, Yi King looked at him baffled, and in his head, he questioned why Cao Meng was running away and thought that he really had a problem with his head as he was already acting arrogant, yet he was praising him instead of beating him up. While Yuani then approached Yi King and wondered how a mere ant like him could run his mouth at the imperial court, he told him that he was courting death. Yi King said nothing, but he agreed with him in his mind, and as he contemplated his next move, he urged him to go ahead and kill him. Yuani lashed his fuchin and warned Yi King that he would only give him three seconds to hand over the jade seal, otherwise, he would leave him without an intact corpse. Yi King's eyes widened in surprise as the fuchin grazed his cheeks and injured them, causing blood to flow. Meanwhile, Yi King's companion looked at him worriedly and thought that it was over because Yi King couldn't possibly fight with a cultivator from the immortal sect. Jai Minju stepped forward and warned Yuani not to dare hurt Yi King. But despite the blood dripping down his cheek, Yi King was unfazed, and he laughed, mocking He Yuani for threatening him. He Yuani was startled when Yi King took a step forward, leaned in, and closed the gap between them while glaring at him. He told him that the immortal sect was heartless because they treated mortal lives as nothing but grass to step on. He Yuani was taken aback when Yi King was able to impose himself and tower over him. Yi King declared that if the immortals didn't die, the entire continent would perish. He proclaimed that the immortal sects were the plague of their world. The officials started to discuss among themselves, and they agreed that Yi King was right. They pointed out that he was not only righteous and loyal but also had a sharp tongue, which opened their eyes that day. They even added that if it were in the days of their ancestors, Yi King would have become another great Confucian scholar. It was just a shame that he was born in the wrong era. Yi Yuani's eyes glimmered, appearing menacing as he called Yi King impudent. 
He clenched his fist halfway, his fingers forming a claw-like shape, releasing a green, lightning-like aura. He charged at Yi King, his eyes still glowing menacingly, and told him to die as he prepared to strike him with his aura-infused hand. Yi King stared expectantly at Yi Yuanei, who was charging at him, and he was glad that it had finally come, he was finally going to die. Yi Yuanei's aura was all over the place, and as his hands were about to reach Yi King's face, Yi King just stood there, unfazed, ready to take Yi Yuanei's attack head on. Yi Yuanei's attack made a buzzing noise as it collided with a golden aura that seemed to be protecting Yi King. The golden sphere that was protecting Yi King deflected all of Yi Yuanei's aura, creating a huge surge of aura towards the officials, overwhelming them. Both Yi King and Yi Yuanei were surprised to see the golden aura that was protecting Yi King, holding a golden chalice in his hand with an orb of golden aura glowing inside it. Jai Minju interjected and called Yi Yuanei impudent for daring to try to harm his subject in his presence. The officials were shocked to see that Jai Minju was holding the imperial artifact that the great Zhu ancestor left behind. As the golden aura inside the chalice crumbled and was blown by the wind, Jai Minju thought that it was a pity that the key left behind by the ancestor had already dissipated over thousands of years. Meanwhile, Yi King's eyes were still fixated on He Yuanyi's point of attack while the officials commented behind him on how Jai Minju had actually used a one-time life-saving artifact on him, someone who was a no-name. Jai Minju quickly ran down the stairs as soon as the golden orb dissolved into thin air, which startled He Yuanyi. Baffled frustration was evident on Yi King's face when Jai Minju suddenly stood in front of him and declared that from that day forward, he and Yi King were one, and if Yi Yuanyi wanted to kill Yi King, he must kill him first. Yi King's companion was crying, and he was so touched that he was shaking while he wiped his tears away, and said that the scene of Jai Minju living and dying with his subject was so touching. Yi King's mouth was wide open in surprise as he cursed in his head and thought that even the emperor was sick in the head, imagining the scene of himself taunting Yi Yuanyi to kill him while Jai Minju stood behind him to save, Aka, sabotage him, made Yi King's head throb, causing him to place his hands on his head and think about how he was there trying to help, but Jai Minju ruined his plans instead. Yi King tried to reason with Jai Minju, but he couldn't get a word in as Jai Minju stood in front of him, extending both his arms, adamant to protect him, and told him not to worry as he wouldn't let anyone hurt him. Upon hearing Jai Minju's words, Yi King couldn't help but spurt out blood, and his face contorted in pain. With Jai Minju still standing in front of him, Yi King's soul left his body, as his plans were already ruined when Yi Yuanyi said that he could spare his life because of Jai Minju, but on the condition that Jai Minju would confer the title of Duke on the Lai family and have Yi King kneel in front of their sect for seven days. Yi Yuanyi turned his back on them and walked away, threatening Jai Minju that if he didn't comply with their conditions and insisted on protecting Yi King, then it would be a shame if something happened. This enraged Jai Minju and made him go after Yi Yuanyi. But Jai Minju was so clumsy that he missed a step. Jai Minju panicked as he lost his balance, while Yi King, who was behind him, did not know what was going on, so he called out to him out of concern. Jai Minju closed his eyes, and he was ready to fall to the floor, but he fell into Yi King's arms. Jai Minju looked so delicate as he blushed and looked up at Yi King. And while Yi King asked him if he was alright, he was thinking that Jai Minju was a little too cute but he was not able to finish his thoughts. Yi King's mind went blank, and he blushed while their surroundings sparkled, while Jai Minju was also blushing as he held his hands up to his chest and leaned against Yi King's arms. The sudden realization hit Yi King, and he quickly backed away from Jai Minju with a shocked expression, while Jai Minju just stood there clueless. Snot ran down Yi King's nose, and his face filled with terror as he thought that Jai Minju was a nuisance, but it was a good thing that what he blurted was that he was a nuisance. While Jai Minju worriedly looked over his shoulders, Yi King looked at his half-clenched hands, and his expression was filled with disgust as he wondered if it was the secret hobby of the body's original owner. Yi King's face twisted in anxiousness, and he was sweating profusely as he looked behind him and wondered if his preference was now men. But after looking at the faces of his companions, who questioned him about his look, and the other officials, including Cao Meng, he said that after looking at those ugly mugs of faces, he was sure that he still liked women. As Yi King cursed in his mind when he realized that he had almost been distracted from his primary objective by Jai Minju, he reminded himself to focus on courting death first. This made him quickly turn towards Yi Yuanyi and laugh as he told Jai Minju that he did not have to worry about him because he, a humble official, had long since decided to put his life on the line for him. Without any fear or doubt in his eyes, he pointed aggressively at Yi Yuanyi and told him that once Jai Minju conferred the title of Duke, Great Ju would lose its foundation. So, even if he died, he would not let Jai Minju agree to it. Yi King opened his eyes wide, his gaze unflinching and showing no signs of backing down. He continued to aggressively point at Yi Yuanyi's face and told him that a river of blood was needed for the people to open their eyes, so he should allow him to pave the way. 
The king proudly preached that since ancient times, no man had escaped death, but he wondered how many dared to say that they died with a clear heart. Suddenly, his body started to glow and was enveloped in a golden aura. While he and he couldn't react due to surprise, Yi King was so astonished that his eyes bulged out so much that they were about to fall out of their sockets. The roof of the imperial court was tranquil, surrounded by fog. But suddenly two pillars of golden light appeared, immediately clearing out the fog. The teacher from afar saw the two pillars of light and quickly recognized them as a sage's visage. One of his students heard and exclaimed that the ancient sages had finally returned. An old man looked up at the pillars of light, filled with anticipation, as he exclaimed that a great Confucian sage was about to appear. He wondered if it was the start of another era of Confucian scholars. The people from the streets were surprised and exclaimed that they had read in the history books about these two visages, which were the images of the left and right prime ministers from the time of the great Zhu ancestor. They wondered who actually had been able to attract not one, but two of the visages at the same time. As Yi King's words echoed, two figures descended from each of the two pillars of light. The men who looked like scholars heard the echo of Yi King's words, and as they recited it themselves, they acknowledged that it was a good poem, one worth passing down for thousands of years. Back at the imperial court, He Yu and Yi and Jai Minju both covered their eyes as they were blinded by the pillar of light that descended upon Yi King, who stood between them. With Jai Minju still able to open only one of his eyes in the background, Yi King looked at the palm of his hands, and his face filled with terror as he cursed internally and wondered why it felt like he had gotten stronger instead. Yi King quickly leaned in towards Yi Yuanyi and grabbed his arms, ordering him to go ahead and kill him at that moment. But instead of attacking him, Yi Yuanyi jerked his arms away while backing off, his face filled with horror as he looked up at Yi King. In Yi Yuanyi's perspective, Yi King was menacingly towering over him with virtuous ki oozing out of him. Yi Yuanyi then regained his composure when he realized that if he allowed Yi King's virtuous ki to draw out the scholarly spirit of the people, the immortal sect would be in trouble. So, despite sweat running down his face, he began accumulating a ball of aura at his fingertips. As he fired the accumulated aura at Yi King, he Yu and he thought that he must cut the problem off at its roots. Yi King stood there, looking surprised as he saw the ray of aura coming right in front of him. The entire court was also blinded by the scholarly key empowerment, and they couldn't believe that Yi King was able to trigger it. Meanwhile, Jai Minju called out to Yi King, his expression filled with worry. A huge explosion occurred, but instead of Yi King getting hurt, it was Hi Yuani who was blown away from where he was standing. He hit his back on one of the pillars of the imperial court. Hi Yuani was in disarray as he slumped down on the ground, unconscious, and missing a tooth. The officials felt a wave of disgust intertwined with fear as they looked down at Hi Yuani who made a hissing sound as steam started to rise from him. On the other hand, both Jai Minju and Kao Meng were startled by the scene they had just witnessed. Yi King was still enveloped by the golden aura as he stood in front of Yi Yuanyi, who was still slumped on the ground, and he was completely confused. He was in a state of panic as he tried to wake Yi Yuanyi up and reminded him that he still hadn't killed him yet. Yi Yuanyi seemed to still be conscious, but he looked extremely terrified. His face turned pale, and he trembled in fear as he saw Yi King standing in front of him. When Yi Yuanyi tried to talk, he spurted out blood from his mouth, and Yi King looked horrified at what he saw. Yi Yuanyi slumped lifeless on the ground, and as Yi King declared his death, the court was in commotion as they exclaimed how it was over for them and how there was going to be big trouble because the Ascension sect would definitely not leave the matter at that. As Yi King looked mortified because of the turn of events, Kao Meng approached him and cupped his fist, expressing that he was amazed. Kao Meng then looked apprehensively at the group of men standing behind him, and as he passed by Yi King, he made a sound with his closed mouth, indicating annoyance. As he saw Kao Meng and the other men walk out of the imperial court, Jai Minju was filled with disbelief, and in his thoughts, he didn't know how in the hell things turned out that way. He then quickly turned to look at Yi King, and when he saw that Yi King looked disheartened with his shoulders slumped, Jai Minju reassured him that with his seat, the Ascension sect would not be able to harm him. Yi King bowed down to Jai Minju and told him that he didn't actually have to worry about him. While in his mind, he sighed and thought about how things got complicated because Jai Minju meddled with his plan. A few moments later, after the court session was dismissed, the officials were scattered outside the building, some were making their way out, and some of them were talking to each other. Meanwhile, Yi King was walking with his shoulders slumped when his companion called out to him. Excitement was evident in his tone. He quickly approached Yi King and gave him a thumbs up, complimenting him on how amazing he was. But Yi King was not in a good mood, and he looked unamused. Not being able to read the room, his companion continued to shower him with praise and reminded him about the saying regarding how a real pearl would always shine, which made Yi King more annoyed, and he gave him a side eye. Yi King quickly walked ahead of his companion while he ordered him to stop talking and to find him a quiet place as he wanted to be alone, which disappointed his companion, but he still complied. 
After a while, in the side halls, Yi King was sitting down with his hands on his head as he leaned on the table in front of him for support as he thought that he finally understood what the scholarly key empowerment was. He stared at the palms of his hands intently as he thought that it was a passive aura that protected him, and he could feel it in his body, but he could neither use it nor get rid of it. Yi King stood up and started to walk outside, but he was still disheartened because it became even harder for him to die. His companion quickly greeted him at the door. Yi King was surprised to see him, and he was concerned if he had been standing there the whole time, asking him if it wasn't hot out there. But instead of answering his question, his companion slapped his own chest with a bright, proud smile on his face and declared that it was his greatest pleasure to guard the door for heroes like Yi King. Yi King's expression changed, and he gave him a side eye when he heard the word hero. While his companion was smiling brightly behind him and bowing at him, he started to walk ahead with a frown on his face and an apology in his head. As they approached a huge door at the end of a tunnel, he thought that he would be disappointing his companion. As he pushed the door open, he realized that he had never once thought about becoming a hero. But what greeted him beyond that door that he had just opened completely caught him off guard, and he looked at it with awe. A huge crowd had gathered, and they seemed to be waiting for him as they quickly greeted him with smiles on their faces as soon as they saw him. With his companion behind him, the crowd quickly gathered in front of him and exclaimed that he was their role model. Yi King's spirit seemed to have lifted as he was touched by the crowd's words and actions. On the other hand, in a side hall somewhere else, someone was talking to Jai Minju, and they told him that Yi King's name would spread throughout the lands after the battle that day, and it would be a good thing for them. Jai Minju was sitting down when he looked at the person he was talking with beside him and expressed his concern that the reason why Yi King became famous would definitely incur the hatred of the Ascension sect, and he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to protect Yi King. The person reached out for the cup of tea on the table as he told Jai Minju that although they had been keeping a low profile, while slowly accumulating for a chance to strike back, it was not easy to catch up after the great Ju had already been declining for so many years. And as he brought the cup up to his mouth to take a sip, he continued to say that Yi King's appearance was a chance for their great Ju to revive itself and show the people that the great Ju dynasty had not yet lost its power. The man who was talking to Jai Minju was the chancellor of the great Ju dynasty, Liu Shen, and he concluded that they must keep Yi King alive. Liu Shen told Jai Minju that there were two methods to keep Yi King safe. The first was to have him ruin his reputation, pretend to apologize, and seek favor with the immortal sect so that they would no longer see him as a threat. Jai Minju sighed and shook his head, saying that with Yi King's personality, there was no way that he would do that. With a smile on his face, Liu Shen told Jai Minju that they would have to use the second method and make Yi King so strong that even the immortal sects would hesitate to attack him, which startled Jai Minju. He then asked how they could make Yi King that strong. With a serious look on his face, Liu Shen glanced at Jai Minju and asked him if he had forgotten about that certain place. Liu Shen smiled as Jai Minju stood up when the sudden realization hit him, and his face lit up as he exclaimed that Liu Shen must have meant the sage's garden. While pouring more tea into his cup, Liu Shen confirmed that Jai Minju's answer was correct and told him that although the Sage's Garden has been sealed by the immortal sects, he must not forget what the last director of the Sage's Garden said with his dying breath. Portraying the last director's image, Jai Minju's eyes widened as he recited what the last director said, that as long as the righteous exist, so will the Sage Garden. So it was just waiting for a successor to lead the school of Confucianism, a successor who was compassionate, selfless, and not afraid of death. Simultaneously reciting the last line of the last director's statement, Liu Shen and Jai Minju's eyes were filled with excitement as they said that should the successor appear, the Sage's Garden would unseal itself. But Jai Minju's expression quickly changed to worry as he placed his hands under his chin and thought that even if Yi King had the potential, he wondered if the Sage's Garden was still too dangerous for him at the moment. Liu Shen stood up from his seat and told Jai Minju that it was true that the trials in the Sage's Garden were a double-edged sword. But he only finished three stages back then and could still harvest plenty of benefits. So as long as Yi King could finish seven stages, it should be enough to make the immortal sex think twice about attacking him. Jai Minju looked down, and his face was filled with worry while sweat ran down his face. However, Liu Shen told him not to worry because the tests at the Sage's Garden were meant to assess a person's nature. So even if someone failed, the side effects were negligible as long as they had a righteous heart. Upon hearing what Liu Shen said, Jai Minju was suddenly filled with determination and ready to proceed. But Liu Shen put his hands under his chin and told Jai Minju that there was no rush. The Ascension sect would be mourning the death of their patriarch, so they wouldn't cause trouble for Yi King until the rituals and formalities were over. Liu Shen stroked his beard as he faced Jai Minju and suggested that they put Yi King through a few tests of their own. Jai Minju responded by asking if Liu Shen thought that Yi King was not trustworthy. While Yi King slept soundly, sprawled in his bed, Liu Shen said that it was not that Yi King was untrustworthy, it was because he was too young. 
Yi King turned to his side and sneezed as Liu Shen explained that young people were always hot-blooded and seeking to correct the world's injustices. In their youth, many people were as righteous as Yi King. As Yi King curled up on his side and wrapped himself in his blanket, Liu Shen continued to explain that those righteous youths would ultimately succumb to the temptations of the real world and become blinded by worldly wealth and pleasure. While the sky lanterns dazzled the sky like stars in the night sky, Liu Shen said that he didn't blame them because, after all, human life is short, meant to be lived colorfully and excitingly. After explaining, Liu Shen told Jai Minju that he wanted to have the mist from the Spring Breeze Tower test Yi King. Jai Minju confirmed if he was talking about the world's most outstanding beauty, Zio Kyankian. The meeting between Liu Shen and Jai Minju ended. In the Imperial Sleeping Chambers, Jai Minju, who had his back turned towards his servants, told them that they could all leave. The servants bowed down and gave him affirmation. Jai Minju removed his robe, stood in front of the mirror, and stared at himself. Suddenly, a masked woman appeared in his room and called out to him. While saying that Jai Minju had said something wrong earlier, she approached him and took off a necklace with a green, oval-shaped pendant. As the woman told him that Sayo Kyankian was not the world's most outstanding beauty, a surge of golden, lightning-like powerful aura surged out of Jai Minju's body. From behind, his hair was elegantly blown by the gust of wind caused by the powerful aura, and his body shone revealing that Jai Minju's body changed from that of a boy to that of a woman with a voluptuous figure. The masked woman leaned in and told her that the title of the world's most outstanding beauty belonged to her as she was so pretty, but no one could appreciate it, and she wondered if another person would ever be lucky enough to see her beauty. The night passed, and morning came. At the Yi residence, Yi King lounged on a bench swing as he collected his thoughts and came to the conclusion that perhaps he had oversimplified the people of the world he was currently in. He admitted that the laws of the cultivation world he was in were much more complicated than he had imagined. He had tried to follow the cliché and get himself killed. But instead of achieving his goal, he had only created one misunderstanding after another. At the Great Zhu Palace, Jai Minju looked worried as Yi King's companion bowed at her with a smile. Yi King realized that the people in that world were not NPCs or side characters in a novel, they were individuals with real emotions. Jai Minju stood there and looked ahead while being surrounded by officials. Yi King thought that the people there were just like the people back on Earth, they all had hopes and dreams that were unfortunately crushed by the corruption of the real world. Yi King looked troubled as he placed his palms on his face and said that it was a pity he was just a passerby and not their savior. He quickly sat up and reminded himself that he must not get attached to the people in that world. Strengthening his resolve, Yi King clenched his fists and said that he must harden his heart and find ways to get himself killed. But, of course, he had to achieve that without committing any crimes. As he said that, as long as he tried hard enough, he could definitely die. He opened the gates of his residence to leave, but he was surprised to see a lot of people waiting for him outside, and they exclaimed in excitement as soon as they saw him come out, asking him if he could guide them. Yi King quickly turned away from the people and started to walk away, which puzzled the crowd. Yi King immediately closed the door and leaned on it, and panic and confusion were evident in his actions, which his servant noticed. The servant told him that those people had been out there since the morning clueless about what Yi King had done the other day. The servant pointed out the basket that was full of letters and told him that he must have completed something great because they had been receiving so many letters from people asking if they could pay a visit. Meanwhile, outside the Yi residence, some people were telling the others to move aside in order to make way for their family's young master. A man with long black hair who was wearing green clothes stood in front of the Yi residence entrance, and upon knowing that Yi King lived in such a place, he quickly acknowledged that the residence's atmosphere was indeed worthy of a virtuous scholar. Yi King leaned in and placed his ear on the door, trying to listen to what the commotion was outside as someone announced that the son of the left chancellor and general outer official, Liu Sanyuan, wished to meet with him. Yi King looked uninterested as he scratched his ear and said that he didn't give a damn if he was the left or right chancellor's son because he didn't want to meet him and he wasn't afraid of offending people. His servant quickly leaned into him and whispered into his ear that he was making a good call because the rumors said that the left chancellor was evil and corrupt, and anyone who tried to side with him died a horrible death. In the blink of an eye, Yi King was already opening the door, which startled the man in green clothes, and then Yi King talked to him, confirming if he was Liu Sanyuan. With a bright and welcoming smile on his face, Yi King told Liu Sanyuan to quickly come in as they had so much to talk about. Yi King sat down with Liu Sanyuan, and he called him young master, asking what had brought him to his residence that day while he poured him a drink. As Liu Sanyuan took the tea in his hands, he noticed that the tea was ordinary, and the tea set was also simple, which was what he expected from a frugal person. Still holding the cup of tea in his hands, Liu Sanyuan informed Yi King that his life was in danger at that moment. 
Liu Sanyuan spurted out the tea that he was drinking when, instead of being alarmed and scared, Yi King stood up and pumped his fist into the air while his eyes were twinkling as he rejoiced that his life was in danger. Realizing his mistake, Yi King scratched the back of his head, and he awkwardly smiled as he told Liu Sanyuan, who was busy wiping the spilled tea off his face, that what he meant was that he would like to bother him to elaborate further on what he had just said. Half an hour later, Yi King continued to pour tea into the teacup as he confirmed with Liu Sanyuan if what he understood was correct, that the Ascension sect would definitely come and kill him. Yi King rubbed his palms together, his eyes twinkled, and he had this creepy smile on his face while he thought about how a good man he Yuan was because even though he was no longer alive, he still continued to help him. Liu Sanyuan looked at Yi King with a questioning gaze as he thought that Yi King truly lived up to his reputation, that he was really not afraid of death, a real hero. Liu Sanyuan smiled at Yi King and told him not to worry too much as the Ascension sect was getting ready for their patriarch's birthday celebration, so they would not attack soon. Yi King slumped in his seat as he confirmed that he understood what Liu Sanyuan meant, and that he thought that relying on oneself was better than depending on others, so it seemed like he needed to take the initiative. Yi King leaned towards Liu Sanyuan and said that aside from the Ascension sect, there must be a few bigwigs they couldn't offend, and then he asked if he could introduce him to some. Liu Sanyuan smiled and proudly agreed to the request, saying that since Yi King wanted to know, he was more than willing to introduce him to some. Standing up from his seat, Liu Sanyuan gestured with his hands and told Yi King that if he wanted to make friends with the powerful, there was one place he must visit, and he would take him there at that moment. A few moments later, they found themselves in a lively, crowded place. At the Spring Breeze house, many beautiful women were being courted by men. Liu Sanyuan proudly declared that the ladies there were all beautiful, especially the eight Warrens, who were incredibly talented. He told Yi King that it was the best place to make friends. However, Yi King looked up and seemed disappointed when he realized that Liu Sanyuan had brought him into a brothel. As they stood in front of the Spring Breeze house, Yi King thought that he wanted to die rather than make friends with others, so he wondered how he was supposed to find enemies to kill him there. While he was thinking, Liu Sanyuan leaned into Yi King's ear and whispered, reminding him that there was one person he couldn't offend in the Spring Breeze house. Yi King looked at Liu Sanyuan, surprised that there was actually something like that. A few moments later, Yi King and Liu Sanyuan entered the Spring Breeze house, where they were greeted by a staircase and a balcony filled with pairs of men and women. A woman noticed Liu Sanyuan and approached him, greeting him and mentioning that he hadn't been there in a long time. Liu Sanyuan responded by saying that he had a special guest that day, so he requested that she prepare a private room and serve all their unique dishes. A group of women performed on a stage, showcasing beautiful, smooth, shiny bare skin, while being surrounded by men. One of the men exclaimed that their dance belonged only to heaven, while another praised Lady Yinger as the best. As the group of beautiful, voluptuous women continued to perform, the men exclaimed that Lady Yinger was the prettiest. Meanwhile, Yi King and Liu Sanyuan were already in their private room, watching the performance through the window by their table. Liu Sanyuan told Yi King that the women performing were the eight warrens and mentioned that countless men in the capital had their eyes on them. Yi King thought that he had really underestimated the ancient people, as they really knew how to enjoy life. Yi King noticed that the room in front of them was the eight warrens' room and wondered about the room at the top and why it was closed. Liu Sanyuan sounded excited when he found out that Yi King had noticed that room too, and he looked at him expectantly, saying that it was the one he had told him about, the one he couldn't afford to offend. Liu Sanyuan told Yi King that Xiao Kyankian of the House of Spring Breeze held a relatively high position compared to the other Warrens, and she didn't dance or sell her body, which intrigued Yi King. Liu Sanyuan said that only a few talented people could catch Xiao Kyankian's attention but those who had seen her were captivated by her beauty. As he said that, Liu Sanyuan's eyes twinkled, an intense light radiated from his body, and he drooled, which made Yi King aware of Xiao Kyankian's beauty from Liu Sanyuan's perverted face. As Yi King picked up his drink, he realized that Xiao Kyankian was in a brothel, and he wondered how she preserved her purity without performing or selling her body. Liu Sanyuan's expression quickly changed into a frowning one as he told Yi King that it was the root of the issue because although many people had chased after Xiao Kyankian, they had all died tragic deaths. Liu Sanyuan then added that there was also a myth that Xiao Kyankian had long been the exclusive property of some big shot from the Imperial Palace, and the only way to meet her was to use one's talent, which Yi King found interesting. Liu Sanyuan looked surprised as Yi King had this mischievous smile while he thought that if he came into contact with such a woman, he would surely die. 
Meanwhile, someone who was covering their mouth with a fan said that it seemed like they had achieved their goal. The person whose shoulder was exposed seemed to be Zio Kyankian, and a woman bowed at her from behind and told her that Jai Minju must have valued Yi King highly because she allowed her, the owner of the Spring Breeze House and the Secretary of the Secret Service, to personally test him. Zio Kyankian was a beautiful, voluptuous, black-haired lady, and as she sat down with her legs crossed, exposing her smooth, silky, white thighs, she covered her face with a fan and requested that the woman send Yi King a letter on her behalf first. Meanwhile, at the stage where the eight Warrens were performing, men were still surrounding the stage, and as one of them called out to Lady Chunner and told her that he had written a poem for her, another one called Lady Yuer's attention and told her that he sincerely liked her. Liu Sanyuan was giving Yi King a tour of the place and told him that they would be hosting the talent show next because at the Spring Breeze house, having money and power alone would not be enough for one to get the attention of the eight Warrens. This made Yi King think and wonder why it was so hard to be a fanboy in that world. Suddenly, a woman came up on stage and caught the attention of the men, telling them to calm down as her master had sent an invitation. The men immediately recognized the woman as Lu Zhu. They couldn't believe what she said and wondered who the lucky person was to be invited. Lu Zhu read from a paper and asked the crowd which one of them was Yi King. The crowd recognized Yi King's name. They wondered if he was the same person who had summoned Sage's visage. While Yi King was extremely surprised by the announcement, the crowd felt discouraged when they realized that someone at Yi King's level was the only one worthy of receiving an invitation. After recovering from the shock, Yi King smiled, and in his thoughts, he was thrilled with his luck because he was thinking about how to approach Zio Kyankian. But she approached him first. Someone in a white robe stood out amongst the crowd and said that Yi King was very strong and he was impressed, but he doubted that his talent might not be as great as they claimed. Yi King looked at the person seriously, but there was no hostility in his stare. The person in the white robe was Kai Ziangao, the first place winner in the Imperial Exam Poetry Expert, and he announced that he wondered if Yi King would be willing to have a match with him. As Kai Ziangao stood there, the crowd quickly recognized him as the young master who had achieved first place in the Imperial Exam, and was known as the poetry expert. They speculated that if it was him, he might really be able to challenge Yi King. Kai Ziangao walked towards where Liu Sanyuan and Yi King were standing. As soon as they stood face to face, Yi King suggested to Kai Ziangao that they should compete since he showed interest. Kai Ziangao thanked him for entertaining his request. However, unbeknownst to him, Yi King was thinking that he had messed with the wrong person. Yi King wondered if he really wanted to compete in poetry with a transmigrator like himself. The competing men each had their own table, paper, and writing tools. As they began to write down their poems, several men who seemed like proctors walked around and monitored the contestants. Meanwhile, both Kai Ziangao and Yi King were sitting down with empty papers in front of them, deep in thought. On the other hand, Liu Sanyuan stood behind one contestant, Sir Huang, and told him that his poem was a little bland, so it was a pity. He then moved on to the next contestant, Sir Zhang, and informed him that his poem was not bad but a little too repetitive. Liu Sanyuan seemed to be enjoying his role as he proceeded to the next contestant, Sir Wang, and praised his poem, remarking that it seemed unique and fresh. Meanwhile, as Kai Ziangao looked at Yi King, who lazily rested his head against his hands, he declared that he would show the world that he was better. Kai Ziangao picked up the writing brush from his table, and someone from the observing crowd exclaimed and announced that he was about to write his poem. However, another person reprimanded them and told them to shut up, emphasizing that they shouldn't disturb Kai Ziangao while he worked. Kai Ziangao quickly and elegantly wrote on the paper, and the characters glowed, leaving the crowd in admiration of his beautiful calligraphy. As Kai Ziangao finished writing, his paper continued to glow with a golden color. The crowd noticed scholarly key emanating from it, which made them realize that he had reached the Athenium level. The crowd looked at Kai Ziangao's work with awe, and one of them said that it was expected of him, that the first half of the poem was enough to reach the Athenium level, while another commented that he didn't think it was Kai Ziangao's limit because, with his scholarly talent, he thought that he could even reach the provincial eminence level. The realms of poetry, from lowest to highest, were Athenium, provincial eminence, kingdom shaking, and exalted under heaven, and Liu Sanyuan, who was intently looking at the competition, was impressed by Kai Ziangao's literary talent. As Kai Ziangao raised his brush pen, he looked disappointed as sweat ran down his face. He put the brush pen back down and said that it was a pity because he was almost there, but a provincial eminence level poem was still too hard for him. Kai Ziangao leaned on the table, and he let out a deep sigh as he thought that his writing seemed like it was not enough to reach the provincial eminence level. Upon seeing that Yi King was just having a drink and hadn't written anything, Kai Ziangao confidently asked him why he hadn't begun writing and suspected that he had run out of ideas and couldn't write anything. 
Yi King laughed as he placed his cup on the table and apologized for the delay. The crowd started to gather around him as he stretched his shoulders and requested that they allow him to show them his humble skills. Zio Kyankian was also watching from her window, and she requested Yi King to not let her down. An intense golden light came out of the tip of Yi King's brush pen as he started to write. With a single stroke of his brush pen, the crowd was in awe of his wonderful composition, and they noticed that the brushwork and style were both unique, so they wondered if it was Yi King's original piece. Kai Zyanga was sweating profusely as he realized what monstrous talent Yi King had for being able to create his own writing style at such a young age. He gritted his teeth and admitted that his calligraphy was not up to par, but he still hadn't lost hope as they were not having a calligraphy competition. But Yi King emitted an intense golden light as soon as he finished the first stanza of the poem. Kai Ziangao could not believe his eyes when he saw that Yi King was able to use one stanza to reach the Athenium level. And as Yi King began to write his second stanza, Zio Kyankian was surprised. Yi King continued to emit that golden aura as he elegantly finished his second stanza. The Spring Breeze house was so bright from the inside that it caught the attention of the passers-by, especially when the crowd cheered because Yi King's poem had reached the provincial eminence level. Two men from the crowd cried, and they embraced each other because they were so touched that they were able to witness a provincial eminence level work with their own eyes. They declared that they could die in peace at that moment. The women who worked at the brothel also looked at the lines of the poem with awe. Some of them started to cry because they discovered that there were still people in their world who understood them. Still covering her face with her fan, Zio Kyankian watched Yi King with anticipation. There was only one more stanza left, and the poem's ability to reach the kingdom shaking level would depend on that last stanza. Yi King continued to emit the golden aura, and it became much more intense. He then closed his eyes as he gracefully raised his brush pen into the air, indicating that he had finished writing his poem. His poem achieved the kingdom shaking level, and Yi King stared at it with such satisfaction in his eyes. Then he smiled awkwardly as he wiped the sweat from his face, and he apologized to Liu Yang, a famous poet who lived around 1000 AD during the Song Dynasty, because he had borrowed his poem to show off. The crowd was frozen where they stood, and none of them were moving or uttering a single word, which made Yi King wonder if he had made a mistake. Suddenly, hearts flew into the air as everyone from the brothel looked at him with extreme admiration. Yi King was alarmed, and he appeared to be in a fight-or-flight mode when he realized that everyone was coming for his body. A few moments later, Yi King found himself in a room with Liu Sanyuan and Kai Ziangao. While he was catching his breath and leaning towards the table, Liu Sanyuan closed the door behind him and leaned on it to keep it closed as if his life depended on it because the people outside were all calling out for Yi King, asking him to look at them again, and some were asking if he was taking an apprentice. Kai Ziangao, who was standing beside Yi King, bowed to him and admitted that he was impressed by Yi King's talent while thinking that the difference between the two of them was comparable to that between a firefly and the moon. As Yi King grabbed him by the arms, sincerely smiled at him, and told him that he actually also really admired his literary talent too, Kai Ziangao was ashamed of how he had acted so arrogantly and rudely earlier when he saw how humble Yi King was. Liu Sanyuan seemed to have successfully secured the door, and he approached Yi King, saying that he needed a favor from him, to which Yi King requested that he tell him what the favor was. Liu Sanyuan bowed down to Yi King and asked him if he could give him the poem, and when Yi King willingly agreed without a fuss, Kai Ziangao's mouth was wide open in surprise, and he called Liu Sanyuan a shameless bastard in his mind because he wanted the poem too. Someone opened the other door behind Yi King, and he glanced at it with anticipation as he knew someone was coming. Liu Zhu entered the room, and she bowed down to Yi King as she handed him a red envelope, saying that Zio Kyankian was inviting him to meet her. Yi King was following Liu Zhu, who was leading the way and they were walking on a higher floor than everyone else. As they continued to walk forward, one of the men below cupped his fist and congratulated him, while another one announced that his poem that day had achieved the kingdom's shaking realm, and he had even received requests from the beauties, so his deed would definitely become a much-shared legend. Yi King cupped his fist and thanked them while, in his mind, he was laughing because, contrary to what the men were thinking, he was not there to enjoy himself but to get killed. As Lu Zhu opened the door to another room, Yi King felt nervous, and in his mind, he hoped that Zio Kyankian would appreciate his kindness because she must kill him. Lu Zhu led Yi King into a room, and in that room, there was a curtain hindering him from seeing Zio Kyankian, who was on the other side and greeted him, saying that it was nice to meet him. Lu Zhu ushered Yi King in and requested that he take a seat in the chair they had prepared for him. Afterward, Zio Kyankian, who was still behind the curtain, asked Yi King if she could ask him to listen to the melody that she was about to play. 
Yi King sat on the chair and looked in the direction of where Xiao Kyankian was with awe as he thought that her voice sounded pretty nice. On the other hand, Liu Sanyuan hugged the role of poetry that he had asked from Yi King while men flocked around him, asking him where he was headed in such a hurry and why he didn't stay for a few more drinks. Liu Sanyuan was so anxious that he stuttered, saying that there was a family emergency. But the men did not believe him and told him that he was so selfish, trying to sneak off after obtaining Yi King's treasured calligraphy scroll. Liu Sanyuan finally managed to slip out, as he was already outside the Spring Breeze house. He let out a sigh of relief, but then someone called him out and told him that their master would like to have the poem that he was holding. Liu Sanyuan was surprised to see Liu Zhu, and he questioned her about whether what she was doing was appropriate. Liu Zhu looked amused at Liu Sanyuan's response and welcomed him to speak to her master, Xiao Kyankian, about it. Liu Sanyuan froze, and he was both horrified and anxious as he held the scroll tightly while Liu Zhu told him that they should see if Xiao Kyankian would also find it inappropriate. Meanwhile, Xiao Kyankian was playing the guzheng with her long nailed, delicate hands. Music filled the room as Xiao Kyankian continued to play the instrument behind the curtain, while Yi King sat down on the chair and calmly listened to the music. But as Lu Zhu entered the room, carrying the scroll of poetry that he got from Liu Sanyuan, it became clear that Yi King was not satisfied with Xiao Kyankian's performance. He raised his brows, and disappointment was evident on his face as he looked in the direction from which the music was coming. Lu Zhu approached Yi King with a smile and asked him what his thoughts were on the flowing water piece that Xiao Kyankian played. Without beating around the bush, Yi King asked Lu Zhu what kind of garbage that music was, and disappointment was very evident on his face. Lu Zhu was taken aback by Yi King's response, and she was so surprised that she couldn't respond to him immediately. Xiao Kyankian was also surprised to hear what Yi King said. Lu Zhu got angry and pointed at Yi King, calling him impudent for daring to speak of Xiao Kyankian's music in such a way. She questioned him if he even knew about temperament, a system of tuning that slightly compromises the pure intervals of intonation to meet other system requirements. Yi King stood up and confronted Lu Zhu, asking what she thought he should have said. Lu Zhu twinkled as she pumped her left fist into the air while holding the poem scroll in the other hand. She proudly said that Yi King should have praised Xiao Kyankian for playing well. Yi King turned his back on Lu Zhu, put his hands under his chin, and admitted that Xiao Kyankian indeed played decently. Upon hearing what Yi King said, Lu Zhu got so annoyed that steam erupted from her head as she said that Yi King should have said that from the beginning. But Yi King added, shaking his head and extending his arms, that it was a shame that the music was soulless, which made Lu Zhu erupt in rage. Xiao Kyankian stopped playing the guzheng, and while still sitting behind the curtain, she asked Yi King what soul he was referring to. Yi King did not hesitate, and he proudly responded that the temperament itself contained life, and in fact, half of its life came from the player's performance, while the other half was left to the piece. When Yi King continued to explain that Xiao Kyankian's performance skills were not bad and it was just a shame that the piece itself was a little lacking, it struck a nerve with Xiao Kyankian causing her to flinch involuntarily. Xiao Kyankian was sweating as she tried to maintain her composure, asking Yi King if what he meant was that her piece was not up to standard. Yi King was startled when Lu Zhu quickly confronted him and told him that all he knew was how to spout nonsense without fundamental knowledge, and she wanted him to know that the composer of the piece was the Imperial Palace's chief master musician, Mo Lao, who was also the master Xiao Kyankian was indebted to. Steam began to erupt from Lu Zhu's head as she continued to say that the piece flowing water was presented from Mo Lao to Xiao Kyankian, and Yi King cut her off, saying that if it wasn't up to standard, then the piece wasn't up to standard. He even criticized what kind of present it was when it was so meaningless. Xiao Kyankian got fed up with Yi King's words, and she told him that since he was showing such disdain towards Mo Lao, she was assuming that he was skilled at playing musical instruments. Then she asked him to expand her knowledge and show her what music with a soul should sound like. Yi King smiled as he pointed his finger at Xiao Kyankian, and in his thoughts, he was excited that she was angry because that was how it should be. While still pointing at Xiao Kyankian, Yi King said that he usually never does anything that is not beneficial to him, but if his piece was better, he demanded Xiao Kyankian to eliminate her plaything. His impudence angered Lu Zhu even more. Xiao Kyankian looked confident and determined when she agreed to Yi King's condition. A few moments later, the Gezheng was now placed in front of Yi King as he sat down and announced that he would be showing them his humble skills, but he honestly told them that his skills were really just average. Yi King looked down and stared intently at the instrument, thinking that he used to love the Gyukin and was confident that he would be able to play flowing water with the classical music he had learned. As soon as Yi King started to play the instrument, Xiao Kyankian mockingly smirked and said that his music did indeed contain soul. Yi King ignored her remarks and concentrated on his performance, as he noticed that he had already gotten the hang of playing the instrument. 
glowing music notes started to emanate from Yiking as he continued to play the instrument. As soon as the notes reached her, Zio Kyankian was surprised because, although Yiking's skills were rusty, she felt something in the piece. She was taken to the riverside, deep within a forest that was teeming with life, and she thought that the music really filled her with a strong sense of life. She was then transported to a scene where the sea lay beneath her feet and clashed with the towering rocks behind her, while flowers bloomed on the side. She thought that it was not just a sense of life that she felt but multiple variations being integrated into one piece of music. Her eyes widened in surprise, and she covered her mouth with her hands as she could not believe that such beautiful music actually existed in their world. Yu King was still playing the instrument when he suddenly pressed on its string, stopping it from producing any more music. Zio Kyankian was so surprised by what he did that she couldn't help but ask him why he had stopped. Yu King smirked knowingly as he looked in the direction of Zio Kyankian who was still sitting behind the curtains. Zio Kyankian was surprised when she realized what she had just done, and with a heavy heart, she bowed down and admitted her defeat. Calmly, Yi King stood up and cupped his fist, stating that he would like her to honor her words and lift the curtains. He thought to himself that even if his skills weren't up to par, his piece, Lofty Mountains and Flowing Water, was a legendary composition, so there was no way Zio Kyankian wouldn't be moved by it. Zio Kyankian complied, and as she stood there, Lu Zhu was fuming mad as she removed the curtains and tied them to their poles, preventing them from covering Zio Kyankian. Zio Kyankian looked embarrassed as she stood in front of Yi King, who was looking at her. Yi King was in awe and thought that Zio Kyankian was so pretty. He felt lucky, as there would definitely be someone behind such beauty who shouldn't be offended. On the other hand, Zio Kyankian blushed as she looked up at Yi King and thought that, along with being able to play a piece that was so extraordinary, he had a decent face as well. Staring at each other, Yi King thought that he should definitely start an affair with her. Meanwhile, Zio Kyankian was thinking that she would definitely make Yi King hers. At the Spring Breeze house, it was already evening, and the house was beautifully lit. Yi King and Zio Kyankian were having a drink and a meal when she asked him if the piece he had played earlier was composed by him. Yi King said that it was just an old score that he had obtained when he was young. Yi King felt awkward when Zio Kyankian leaned into him and asked if he could let her look at the score. Yi King scratched the back of his head and looked away, saying that he had burned the score in an accident while playing with fire when he was young. Zio Kyankian responded that it really was a shame. But in her mind, she was making a fuss, calling him a liar, and questioning him if he thought she was a three-year-old that he could easily trick. Yi King was holding two cups, he smiled brightly as he handed one to Zio Kyankian and told her that they should have another drink. This made Zio Kyankian smile and think that since Jai Minju wanted her to test him, he shouldn't blame her for embarrassing him that night. Resting her head in the palm of her hands, Zio Kyankian stood up, wobbling as she called out to Yi King. She acted as if she had lost her balance, and Yi King was startled when she fell towards him. The atmosphere was romantic, sparkles, feathers, and flowers were depicted in the scene as Zio Kyankian fell into Yi King's arms. They looked at each other, and Zio Kyankian smiled slyly while she thought and asked herself who would be able to resist her. Yi King had a sleazy smile on his face as he thought that since he wanted to act, he should go all out. He pouted his lips and closed his eyes, but instead of meeting Zio Kyankian's lips, his lips met her fingers. Yi King was surprised, and Zio Kyankian asked him if he was really interested in her, a sickly willow. Yi King looked at her intently, and she looked mesmerized as he told her that if she was a sickly willow, then it would make all the other women in the world utterly rotten willow trees. But Zio Kyankian looked confused when Yi King looked away, acting like he was in pain, saying that it was a shame as she was already the woman of a bigwig, so the two of them weren't destined to be. Zio Zio Kyankian looked confused, and she was slightly annoyed when she heard that she was a bigwig's woman. But then she smiled when she realized that Yi King must have heard the rumors floating around the streets, and she told him that those were just rumors spread to confuse others, which surprised Yi King. Zio Kyankian smiled, saying that her body was still wholly pure, and upon realization, Yi King's face twisted with disgust. Zio Kyankian waved her hand in front of Yi King, calling out to him with concern in her eyes. But Yi King cringed and his face twisted in disgust as he cursed and asked himself what he was doing wasting his time there when there was no bigwig that would kill him if he hooked up with Zio Kyankian. Yi King pushed Zio Kyankian by the shoulder. She fell and sat on the ground as Yi King bowed in front of her and told her that it was late, so he would be taking his leave first. While still sitting on the ground, Zio Kyankian looked downhearted as she told Yi King that while she might not know any bigwigs, she could still bring many benefits to him, which made Yi King glance at her. Zio Kyankian stood up and told Yi King that she was a spy from the kingdom of Kivan Ruz and that she had infiltrated the capital to collect information on the great Jew and recruit talents for Kivan Ruz. 
She leaned into Yi King's chest and seductively traced her fingers on it as she told Yi King that there was currently unrest amongst the civilians of the Great Jew and the treacherous court officials held power. She said that he was a god-gifted genius and suggested that he stop wasting his time as a minor official and join her to serve Kiev and Ruse. But Yi King pushed her away, which surprised Zio Kainkian greatly. Yi King looked down at her with disdain and told her to maintain her dignity, while in his mind, he was thinking what a waste of his time it was because Zio Kainkian was another one who didn't want to kill him. Zio Kainkian looked up at him in wonder as she asked herself if Yi King was really that resolute. As Zio Kainkian wanted to see how Yi King would resist her next move, an ominous aura oozed out of Zio Kainkian as she glared at Yi King, saying that he was filled with talent. Continuing to emit the dark aura, Zio Kainkian stood up and told Yi King that it would be too much of a waste if he was annihilated along with the Great Jew. Yi King was sweating profusely while he grabbed his head in between his hands, and he looked like he was in pain while Zio Kainkian continued to say that if he were to seek refuge in Kivan Ruth, the head of the state would definitely treat him as a treasured scholar of the country. Still grabbing his head with his hands, Yi King was already kneeling on the ground due to pain while Zio Kainkian towered over him, oppressing him with her dark aura, and told him that when the time came, she would be with him for eternity. With a sinister look on her face, she leaned in at Yi King, who was still grabbing his head, and asked him if that wouldn't be wonderful. Yi King gritted his teeth and groaned in pain as he glared at Zio Kainkian. With all his might, Yi King told Zio Kainkian that he refused, and then he emitted a very strong golden aura that took Zio Kainkian by surprise, pushing her backwards. Zio Kainkian was now standing far away from Yi King while he struggled to stand up from the ground, and she could not believe that Yi King was able to resist her bewitching spell. Her eyes widened in awe as she realized that Jai Minji was correct about Yi King. But then she felt that what she did was not enough, and she refused to believe that Yi King would still be able to resist if it were a matter of life and death. Zio Kainkian continued her act, and as she continued to release her dark aura, she asked Yi King if he seriously did not know how to appreciate the goodwill she was showing him. Yi King was still slouching, and he looked annoyed while he gritted his teeth. He rested his head in the palm of his hands and thought that Zio Kainkian was really oppressive. Releasing an aura from her fingertips, Zio Kainkian slashed it in front of her, and she quickly lunged towards the staggering Yi King with that. Yi King turned pale when he saw Zio Kainkian's fingers, which were about to pierce him. Zio Kainkian stopped her attack right before her fingers reached Yi King's throat. As Zio Kainkian pointed her aura infused fingers at his throat and told him that his uprightness meant nothing to her, Yi Ling figured out that she wanted to kill him. Yi King shuddered as he tried to hide his excitement. He thought that when one door closes, another one opens, and with such a good opportunity presenting itself, he should make his act as realistic as possible. He became a reincarnated drama queen. He placed his hands on his chest and called Zio Kainkian a traitor, saying that she should kill him if she must and that there was no need for her to blabber. Zio Kainkian was taken aback by his response. She tried to threaten him again, saying that she was giving him one last chance, and as she was about to ask him if he really treasured his talent. Yi King cut her off, telling her to shut up and kill him because a brilliant military general does not avoid war due to fear of death and a martyr does not go against their morals to beg for their lives. Zio Kainkian gritted her teeth, and sweat ran down her face as she thought about how she had grown used to seeing many despicable cowards who would do anything to save their own skins after years of being in charge of spies, so she couldn't understand how Yi King could be so steadfast in his values that he was even willing to offer his life to remain faithful to them. Still raising her fingers up to Yi King's throat, Zio Kainkian told him that he only has one life, so she couldn't understand why he insists on asking for death while the other scholars betray their motherland for the sake of wealth and glory. Unbothered by the threat, Yi King confidently told Zio Kainkian that even if she sought refuge in Kivan Ruse, she couldn't change the fact that the blood of the Great Jew flows through her, and since that was the case, he would give her some advice. He told her that being despicable was a despicable person's warrant and being noble was a noble's epitaph. He closed his eyes and spread his arms, portraying that he was ready to accept his fate, and said that although the great Jew may seem hopeless in her eyes, he begs to differ, he told her to do it as he strongly believes that what doesn't kill him makes him stronger. Zio Kainkin's eyes widened, and she was in awe. She then looked embarrassed as she furrowed her brows and said that everyone knew that he had entered her room. She put down her arms, turned away, and told Yi King that she wouldn't kill him there, which surprised him. Zio Kainkian looked disheartened as she released some auras with her hand and told him that she had poisoned his wine, so without the antidote, he was doomed to die in three days. While Zio Kainkian told him that he was free to come find her anytime if he changed his mind, Yi King protected himself with his arms as the auras that Zio Kainkian released hit him and pushed him back. Yi King was thrown out of the room, and he was disappointed that she just kicked him out just like that. 
Yi King skeptically looked around as he wondered if Xiao Kyankian was not afraid that he would report her for revealing that she was a spy. But it was none of his concerns, so he shrugged and nonchalantly walked down the stairs while shaking his head, thinking that Xiao Kyankian should consider herself lucky that the person she met was him. As Xiao Kyankian arrived downstairs, men flocked over to him, and while they asked if he was done so quickly and were interested in why he was radiating happiness, he simply smiled at them and thought that he couldn't be bothered with their crap because he would be dead in three days anyway. Meanwhile, Xiao Kyankian sat down, trembling and gritting her teeth, as she opened the scroll that contained the poem Yi King had written earlier. As Yi King walked down the streets, it was already morning. He was in such a good mood that he greeted the people he came across. Xiao Kyankian thought they were all like-minded people, but he was destined to be in the spotlight and guide the masses forward, while she had already grown accustomed to the shadows. Yi King continued walking down the street, saying hello to the people he encountered, leaving them confused in return. On the other hand, Xiao Kyankian held the scroll containing Yi King's poem close to her chest, and expressed that, since it was the case, he should let her shield him from all the evil hiding in the darkness. After the events, at the Great Zhu Imperial Palace, Xiao Kyankian reported to Jai Minju. She was reading the poem Yi King had written the other day, and Jai Minju praised it, saying it contained words of treasure and wisdom, full of meaning, which was to be expected of a kingdom-shaking poem. Xiao Kyankian smiled brightly as she told Jai Minju that she had seduced Yi King with her beauty, and invited him to join Kivan Ruse, but she was sternly rebuked by him. Xiao Kyankian gestured with her hand and continued to say that she threatened to kill Yi King if he continued being stubborn, but he did not waver at all. He even said that a brilliant military general does not avoid war due to fear of death and a martyr does not go against their morals to beg for their life. Jai Minju exclaimed that she was right about Yi King after all. However, Jai Minju was surprised when Xiao Kyankian bowed to her and explained that, after getting to know Yi King on a deeper level, she felt that they shouldn't let him in on their plan. Jai Minju asked her why she thought that. Xiao Kyankian explained that Yi King was too strong-willed and couldn't stand injustice. If he knew what they were doing, she was afraid he wouldn't be able to control himself and would expose himself by standing up for them. This made Jai Minju say that it wouldn't do because they had not accumulated enough. Xiao Kyankian continued, not only that, but the Great Zhu desperately needed someone to stand in the spotlight who could rouse the people's fighting spirit and inspire the court officials at the moment. Xiao Kyankian trailed off when she concluded that if that were the case, Yi King's life might be in danger. Jai Minju stood up and slammed her hands on the table, saying that she would kill whoever dared lay their hand on Yi King. On the other hand, at Yi's residence, Yi King was drinking and dancing happily, singing about how he was going to die and how he was coming for the celestial ruler. This made his servant wonder if he had lost his mind from drinking too much. Three days had passed, and Yi King, who looked shaken and downhearted, stood in front of the Spring Breeze house. His eyes looked lifeless, and he seemed sorrowful as he wondered why there wasn't a single trace of the poison taking effect. He barged into a room and, at the top of his lungs, yelled, demanding an explanation. Xiao Kyankian was sitting down, playing with her gizheng, and she reminded him of his words where he said that even if she sought refuge in Kevin Roos, she couldn't change the fact that the blood of the great Jew flowed in her. She said that when she heard him say those words back then, she came to a realization. She lazily placed her chin on her palm as she leaned in on the table and told him that she voluntarily turned herself in and assisted the authorities in eradicating Kevin Roos hideout. This made Jai Minju decide to drop the issue and pardon her for her crimes on the account that she repented and made up for her mistakes in time. Yi King stood there and asked Xiao Kyankian about the poison. She smiled brightly as she shrugged her shoulders and told Yi King that there was never any poison to begin with because that was just a joke she pulled on him. Yi King grabbed his head, and he looked extremely devastated. In his mind, he was calling Xiao Kyankian a minx and requesting for her to stop being so cruel. 